Now this morning, as we begin Easter, this morning I'm starting a new series. I'm excited about this series and I've been looking forward to it. This series is on the number three in the Bible, the different places that we see three in the Bible. It, it, it is an interesting numerology in the Bible is an interesting thing. The number seven, the number 30, the number 40, the number 12. You see certain numbers pop up over and over again. What I wanted to look at with this one is, is the number three. So we're going to talk about, um, for example, in the Old Testament, there were three patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're going to talk about that. There were, um, this is an interesting one, you may never have heard a sermon on this, also in the Old Testament, there were three objects placed into the Ark of the Covenant. We're going to talk about the significance of those three objects. But this morning, I want to talk about three days. Obviously, the three days between Friday and and Sunday, the three days between the crucifixion and the resurrection, between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. I want to talk about those three days. So turn in your Bible, if you will, to Matthew chapter 27, as we talk about three days. Matthew 27, and I'm going to read verse 50. Matthew 27 and 50. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit on the cross, cried out with a loud voice, and then he died. No, he didn't swoon. He didn't faint. He died. Jesus was dead on that cross. Now, turn over, if you will, to the next chapter, Matthew 28, beginning with verse 1. Matthew 28 and verse 1. Now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. That is the tomb where Jesus was. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guard shook for fear of him and became like dead men. And the angel answered and said to the woman, women, the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen as he said. The angel spoke to the women and said, You seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. Let's pray. Lord, I ask in the next few moments that you will speak to each of us, to all of us, on this Easter Sunday, God, show us, reveal to us exactly what you want us to see, what you want us to hear. Not my words, not my words in any way, shape, or form. Yours only. You are risen indeed. Speak through me. And if you cannot speak through me, speak in spite of me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I enjoy reading. I do a tremendous amount of reading. What I don't particularly read is novels. Occasionally, I will read a science fiction novel or, or fantasy, but uh, like uh, Lord of the Rings or something like that. But for the most part, I don't read a lot of that. What I usually like to read, uh, particularly I like biographies or autobiographies on famous people, or I like historical books on history, books on World War II, books on this thing that happened, books on presidents, books on, on famous people. There, there, are, there is an exception to that, which is I usually prefer to read biographies about people that I don't know much about. Um, for example, one of the best biographies I ever read was a biography on Genghis Khan. I don't know how many of you know anything about him, the, 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 the founder, the ruler of the, the Mongol army and how they invaded China and most of the known world and, and all the rest of it. He's, it's a fascinating book, fascinating character. I knew Genghis Khan, but I didn't really know anything about him. And it was a, it was a great book, fascinating book. What I don't read a lot of is people that I feel like I know a lot about already. For example, like George Washington or, uh, or Abraham Lincoln. You feel like, okay, I know most of the story of Abraham Lincoln. I, you know, I, I, I took history class. I, I, I've read about history. I've read about the Civil War and all the things that surrounded that. I just feel like how much more could you get or understand or learn from the story of, of Abraham Lincoln? But the problem is what we do is when there's no new information, we can often add information to the thing to make it more interesting. 
So for example, a number of years ago when our oldest son Mark was in middle school, he went to spend the night with a buddy and he came home and told me about this great new movie. He was like, Dad, I saw the coolest movie. It's the best movie I've ever seen. You're going to want to see it. And I was like, really? And he goes, yeah, it's a history movie. And I was like, it's a history movie? And he goes, yeah. And I said, and you watched it, son? And he said, yeah, it was great. And I said, what was the name of this history movie? And he said it was called Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. And I was like, now, boy... Let's talk about the level of history involved in a movie titled Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter. For those of you that are older and you think I'm joking, I absolutely am not. A number of years ago, probably about 10 years ago now, a movie came out called Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter. And he hunted vampires. You ready for this? He hunted vampires with a silver axe because you can kill vampires with with silver. And I was like, now Mark, you know that Abraham Lincoln was real, don't you? Yes, I do. I said, you know that he didn't hunt vampires, don't you? Yes, I do. Okay, as long as we're clear on where history begins and ends, then we're okay. But my point is, maybe not to that extreme, but you do have people that are so willing to have something new in their book, have something new in their article, that they invent things, pull things out of the existing history that what we know, and it just doesn't add up. It's bad enough when you do that about historical figures like Abraham Lincoln or George Washington, but it is detrimentally worse when we do that about the figure and the person of Jesus. And in particular, if we add anything to the Easter story. Now, probably in the last almost 2,000 years of church history, everything that's ever been preached about the Easter story has been preached. Everything that we know has been spoken. Everything that, we're, that we can read in the gospel accounts has been dissected and preached so I want to put your mind at ease this morning. I'm not coming up with anything new. This isn't, I'm not adding anything to the story. I'm not trying to find some new angle to the story or something where we, if we add this to this and we equal this whole new thing. That is kind of like what we call heresy. <laughs> That's what we want to stay away from. What I want to do is simply talk to you about what was happening in these three days from Friday night until Sunday morning? What was going on? What was happening in those three days? So let's look at it. We just read Matthew 27 and 50, Jesus dies on the cross. I want to look at the next verse now, Matthew 27 and 51. Matthew 27 and and 51. Then, that means after his death, immediately following the death of Jesus on the cross, then, behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. But look again at the beginning of that verse. Then, after his death, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Which veil in the temple? It is obvious from the writer. It is obvious. It is the veil. It is the veil. It is the veil in the temple that separates everything else in the temple from the holy of holies. That veil was thick, linen upon linen upon linen, inches thick. No light, no sound could enter from the outside because that is where God lived. And only one day, and on one day only, the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies and make atonement, pay the penalty, put the blood on the mercy seat for the sins of the entire nation. And that was it. You didn't just walk into the Holy of Holies. Random, you know, random Joe didn't just show up at the Holy of Holies. No priests went in the Holy of Holies. No Levites went in the Holy of Holies. It was for the high priest and the high priest only, and only he entered once a year on the Day of Atonement, where they were making atonement, making sacrifice for the sins of the entire people for the entire year. And in the moment that Jesus dies... The veil is ripped in two. It is important how it is ripped. Recorded in three of the Gospels, all three of the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The veil is not ripped 
in the middle, this way. The veil is not ripped from bottom to top. The veil is ripped from top to bottom, indicating that only what? Only God could have done it. Only God could have done it. The veil is high, too high for anyone to be up there. No one would be up there anyway. No one could start that tear from the top. So it is torn from top to bottom, indicating to us what? The death of Jesus Christ Payment for our sins, our sins on his body, his blood shed for us. His sacrifice removes the barrier between sinful humanity and a holy God. His his death rips the veil. The veil is torn in two. The, The separation that began in the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve sin, and God comes down and says, the first question in the Bible, where are you? For thousands and thousands of years, humanity has had no way to bridge that gap. That question hung in the air. Where are you? And we would say, we're here, but the problem is there was a gulf between us, and the gulf was our sin on one side and a a sinless God, a holy God. His holiness here, our sin here, and nothing could bridge that gap. There was no way. The veil, we built the veil. We constructed it with our own sin. There was no way to get back into right relationship. And so the question hovers and hangs in the air. Where are you? And the answer, of course, is we're here, buried and dead in our sin, With no hope and no help, we're doomed and damned. Where are we? We're here. And there was no way for us to get back to a holy God. The only way was for him to send his son for us. And the veil is torn. I want you to see an interesting verse. As I was doing some research, I never saw this before. I want you to look at Hebrews chapter 10. And verse 19, Hebrews 10 and 19, the writer of the book of Hebrews says this, he says, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiness by the blood of Jesus, I want to stop right there. We have boldness now. We have boldness to come before the the holiness of God, to enter the holy of holies. We have boldness to come before a holy God because of the blood of Jesus. Not because anything we've done. The blood of Jesus. Now look. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiness by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us, through the veil that is his flesh. Fascinating. The writer of the book of Hebrews makes a direct connection between the humanity of God suffering and the veil in the temple being torn. Jesus fully God and fully man. And yet, as his humanity dies, what happens? That veil is torn away. The humanity is dead. But Jesus says on the cross, into your, into your hands I commit my spirit. He says, my flesh is dying. My flesh is failing. This veil, the veil that covers me. We know this because what happened? He takes Peter, James, and John onto the Mount of Transfiguration, and they see him as he is, which is what? They see him in his God state. The veil, the humanity, the flesh, the veil is taken away, and they see him as he is, the Son of God. And so as his veil, the veil of his flesh and his humanity that is covered fully man, fully God, as it fails, as it dies on the cross, as that veil is torn away, the veil in the temple is ripped. That is an awesome moment because what it is saying to us is the relationship has been restored. The, Jesus restores the relationship. Jesus connects us. The question, where are you? The gulf between sinful humanity and a holy God no longer exists. The relationship is restored. The connection is redeemed. We are together again. The veil, his body, is torn and killed for us. The veil in the temple 
is ripped in two at the exact same time, indicating that the penalty has been paid and the connection is resumed. The relationship is restored. Years and years ago, before you have kids, you and your spouse always say to yourself, when we have kids, dot, dot, dot. And those things that follow the dot, dot, dot are almost immediately broken by, by, by the realization of what having kids means. For those of you that aren't married, don't have kids, trust me, that moment will come. Make all, write all those wonderful things down. When I have kids, dot, 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 we're not going to let them watch television. Trust me, that'll last about three months. And you're like, oh my gosh, just put them in front of the TV. Turn something on, right? When we have kids, dot, dot, dot. Now here's one that me and Courtney said. When we have kids, we'll never argue in front of the kids. Oh, Lord. Now here's the problem. For us, you got five people living in a small house, two of them adults, and those two adults angry with each other. There's not a lot of places that you can go and argue where it's not in front of the kids. Now, me and Courtney don't fight all the time, and as we've stayed married longer and longer, we fight less and less. But about 15 years ago, uh, Mark was maybe in first or second grade, and me and Courtney were, I wouldn't say fighting, but arguing um, emphatically. So, <laughs> arguing uh, emphatically. And so, we were at the table arguing. And all of a sudden, Mark, he was probably in first or second grade at the time. He says, can I be excused? I have to go to my room and pray. (laughs) And like the argument was like over, right? Because we looked at each other and we laughed and I was like, oh, you know, because your kids always shame you into doing the right thing. So can I go to my room, right? So here's the thing. Now, I've done tons of marriage counseling in my line of work. In the ministry, you do a lot of marriage counseling. You know what's the first thing I ask when you come in? If you come in for marriage counseling, be prepared to answer this question. The first thing I ask is, do you want this marriage? Do you want to stay married? Do you want this marriage to work? Do you want this marriage to survive? If the answer is no, or the answer is I don't know, I'll be honest with you. I tell people, well, you need to figure it out because until the answer is yes, I don't have a lot to do. I don't have anything to talk about with you here because it is on that part. Do you want this marriage to work, to last, to survive, to, to thrive, to restore, to renew? Do you want this marriage? The answer has to be yes. Now you say, what does all this have to do with the veil in the temple? All right, here it is. What we have imagined is that Jesus is like a marriage counselor for sinful humanity and a holy God. So what we've imagined is that he's on one side talking to all of us, and he's like, hey, you know, could you, could you, uh, could you say thank you more when, uh, when, when, you know, when God takes the, uh, when God washes the dishes, could you say thank you? And we're like, well, I guess. And he goes over here to God the Father, and he's like, you know, maybe you could take out the garbage every once in a while. And he's like trying to, to, to do, no, 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 no. That's like not how this works. He's not a marriage counselor trying to find things for the two sides to agree upon. Before the veil of Jesus, before fully God and fully man, before the flesh, his veil of flesh, until it suffered and died and the blood was shed for us, there was no way these two different things were ever coming back together. It was not, oh, we'll do a little bit better. And Jesus says, okay, God, they say they're going to be a little bit better. And God says, well, I guess I, can, I guess I can tolerate a little bit of sin. And you go, great, wonderful, we're making progress. All right, God says he can tolerate a little bit of sin. You guys are going to try a lot harder. I think we can make this marriage work. That's like not how it was. That's not how it existed. There was no way. The relationship was irrevocably broken. Sinful humanity, a sinless God, there was no way to bridge the gap. We weren't going to do any better on our own, and he wasn't going to allow any sin into his presence. The veil had to be torn. The sacrifice had to be made. The blood had to be poured out on the mercy seat. And the writer of the book of Hebrews tells us in another place that the blood of bulls and goats was never, ever, ever going to be enough. But he says the blood of Jesus is shed once 
and for all. Once and for all. The relationship is restored. The relationship is redeemed. The relationship is renewed because of His shed blood on the cross. But that's not the end of it. Now look, if you will, back at Matthew again. This is a verse that you've probably seen or looked at, but haven't ever really thought about a lot. Look at Matthew 27 and 52. Back to where we were. We talked about this. The veil of the temple is torn. The earth quakes. The rocks were split. Look at 52. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves, after his resurrection, they went into the holy city, that is Jerusalem, and appeared to many. <laughs> all right, now I'm going to be honest with you. I bet if I had all of you in this church right now and I asked you to raise your hands and say, did you know other people were raised from the dead when Jesus was? I'm thinking I would get about half participation. Maybe half of everybody in here would know that. But I want you to focus on this. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. 53, this is important. And coming out of the graves after, and coming out of the graves after his resurrection. Most people that know that verse think that it happened when he died, because it's included in the death description in Matthew, but Matthew makes it clear the resurrection of those saints into whatever happened, how they were resurrected, did not happen until after Jesus' resurrection, which tells us what? This is so wonderful. His resurrection moment was not contained to just himself. His resurrection power, the life that ebbed out of the resurrected Jesus, went into other bodies in the cemetery, and they were raised. Now this is where we have to be careful that we don't wander into territory that resembles Abraham Lincoln vampire hunter. All we can go by is what the Bible tells us. A lot of people will tell you that it was Old Testament saints resurrected, like Abraham or Moses. All right, I don't think that's who it was. If you're asking my opinion, I have two reasons for that. Neither Abraham nor Moses were buried in Jerusalem. The second thing is, how would you know they were Abraham and Moses? There were no pictures. There were no drawings <laughs> This is thousands of years ago. How would they know? Did he have a little business card that said Abraham, father of the Hebrew people? And he was like passing it out to everybody they met on the street? How would they know? Here's what I believe. When it says saints, I believe that Matthew is talking about people who had died during the ministry of Jesus that believed that Jesus was the Messiah. I believe that Matthew was referring to the people that they knew. There were huge crowds that followed Jesus. We know that the people who loved Jesus died sometimes. We already have that description in John of the resurrection of Lazarus. So we know that people who loved Jesus and followed him and believed in him had passed away during his ministry. They wouldn't recognize Moses or Abraham, but they would recognize somebody who had walked and talked with them for two years and had passed away. These people are raised from the dead. Now, I've also heard that it was, it was like their spirits, and they saw ghosts walking around Jerusalem, and then the ghosts were gone and went to heaven with Jesus. Except, that's not what it says. It says, people raised from the dead, saints raised from the dead. What does all that have to do with us? What it has to do with us is this. The resurrection is wonderful and magnificent and important. It is the event in Christianity, and it is the moment in the life and ministry of Jesus. But I believe... I want you to stay with me on this. I believe that we have overemphasized the idea of eternal life at the expense of de-emphasizing life right now. 
Listen, resurrection gives us eternal life. That's wonderful. That's great. That's magnificent. That's the best thing you're going to hear today. The resurrection of Jesus. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. His resurrection from the dead allows us to access that same eternal life through belief in him. That's wonderful news. But here's the better news. You're not waiting till you die to experience newness of life. Jesus was resurrected, and those people were resurrected at the same time. You can be brought out of your tomb this morning. You can be brought out of your chains. You can be brought out of your bondage. I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He is speaking in the now. He is speaking in the present. The people were resurrected from the dead after he was resurrected. Proving to us that we can find newness of life now. Is eternal life waiting? Yes, that's wonderful. That's fantastic. That's amazing. That's great. But the stuff that you're struggling with, you can be set free of that now. Too often we have, we in the modern evangelical church and particular denominations have overemphasized this idea of say this prayer, be saved. And then people go, what next? And they go, nothing. You just wait to die. And people go, yeah, but what about all this baggage? What about all this bondage? What about these chains? What about this addiction? And they go, don't worry about that. You got eternal life because of that little prayer you said. Eternal life is wonderful. I'm not negating that. I am saying God has, did not come for us to live in bondage and beg to die and go to heaven. That is not God's will for our life. That is not who God has called us to be. His resurrection power is for now. He raised from the dead and raised with him people who were dead and in the grave. We always forget about that. We talk about, oh, well, he raised the girl. Oh, he raised the widow's son. Oh, he raised Lazarus. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and came out of their graves after his resurrection. That is what God wants for you. That is what God wants for me, for all of us. Look, if you will, at Romans very quickly. I want you to see two verses in Romans. Look first at Romans 6 and 4. Paul is writing, and he says in Romans 6 and 4, Therefore we were, ba- we were buried with Jesus through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. He is talking about the present. Jesus died and was buried. We are baptized. We are buried under the water, brought out of the water into what? Newness of life, this life. As we were buried, so also we are raised from the dead as Christ Jesus was raised from the dead. Now turn over two chapters to Romans 8 and 11. You're probably going to know this verse. Romans 8 and 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. The same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead is offering these mortal bodies newness of life. We are offered restored relationship and glory to God we are offered resurrected life resurrected life resurrected eternal life yeah one day down the road resurrected eternal life believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved you can inherit eternal life The same spirit that raised him offers eternal life. But that's not all. The same spirit that raised Christ Jesus lives in your mortal bodies and offers you resurrected life this morning. The relationship can be restored. 
We can, we just read it, we go boldly before the throne. We can walk into the throne room of God and God sees Jesus when he looks at us. When he looks at us, he sees Jesus because his blood is on the mercy seat. We in sinful humanity can boldly approach the throne of a holy God because of the restored relationship. The resurrected life, the life that comes from the power of the resurrection is not just for eternal life. Although glory to God, there is that. It is for life to be transformed in the here and now. You do not have to live another day, another week, another year in the same bondage that you've struggled with. You don't have to be held by the pain of your past. You don't have to be held by the bondage of rage. You don't have to be held in the chains of unforgiveness. You don't have to be held in the tomb of addiction. The resurrected life is not just for eternal life. It's for here. It's for now. It's for the chains and the bondage to be broken and the freedom to come in this moment. You shall have life and that more abundantly. Let me close with this. I'm going to tell you four quick stories, but they're really just one story. One's my story and one's my dad's story. Years and years and years and years ago in the early 1980s, my dad went to Mexico all the time as a missionary. All the time he went to Mexico. One time he went and preached in the Tamaulipas State Penitentiary. My dad has said many times to me, if there's a hell on earth, it's the Tamaulipas State Penitentiary. He went and preached in the Tamaulipas State Penitentiary in an open courtyard. And as dad and a handful of other Americans were leaving, he heard voice coming through a wall. Senor, Senor. They looked over and there was a, a, an interior wall in the prison. And there were windows at the top with bars on them. Dad said, where's that voice coming from? And the translator said, that's coming from the maximum security wing of this prison. And the translator said, it's very bad over there. Those are the most dangerous criminals. My dad went over, and there was a window probably eight feet off the ground with bars on it. My dad said he saw hands grab onto those bars. And a voice said from the other side, Senor, ayúdame, 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 which means save me, save me. My dad said the guys that were with him pushed him up. My dad grabbed a hold of those bars. A prisoner on the other side grabbed a hold of the bars. My dad spoke Spanish and led him in a prayer of belief in Jesus. My dad said the prayer ended and his arms were shaken. And he was losing his grip. And he heard the prisoner on the other side say, gracias. And he let go of the bars. My dad never saw his face, doesn't know his name, never saw him. But the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead can also raise your mortal body. The reason that my dad was there on that mission trip was because years before his life had been transformed. You've heard his story, most of you, many of you. My dad in the ministry, but depressed, suicidally depressed, discouraged, no power, no life, no resurrection. And he had an encounter with God that changed him. And then he had that encounter in the Tamalipa State Penitentiary that changed somebody else. I went to uh, way up into northern Ghana one time, years ago. 
and we were dedicating a church, Sammy told me the chief of this village is going to come to this dedication. And I said, great. As the chief was there, I felt like he was more engaged. I don't know how many of you have traveled in sub-Saharan Africa, but the chief is very, usually very distant. He comes to events like that because, let's be honest, he's a politician, basically. A chief in a rural village is a politician. The other thing about chiefs is they don't speak to you directly, for the most part. They speak through their uh, speaker. Most chiefs have a speaker. They have one guy that carries their the totems of their chiefhood, their insignias. There's another guy who walks with the chief, and he does the speaking for the chief. The chief doesn't, <laughs> doesn't uh, you know, lower himself to speak to anybody who isn't a chief. But as I was preaching that morning, I just felt like this chief was really locked in and focused and talking and everything. As I was preaching... When the service was over, I went up to him and I spoke to the chief directly, which while it's not illegal, it's, you know, party foul. <laughs> it's, it's, it's okay, but it's not just the best thing. I spoke to that chief and I, I asked him, I said, do you want to believe in Jesus? And he spoke to me, of course, through a translator. And he spoke to me and said, yes. And after service, outside of that church that we built, in the dirt, standing there, I led that chief in a prayer to be, the, to be a believer in Jesus Christ. Every time I go back to that village, which isn't often, but every time I go back, I see that chief and he greets me and shakes my hand and hugs me. Because the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead also gives life to his mortal body. And the only reason that I'm able to go to Africa and preach and travel to Thailand, and the only reason that I'm in this pulpit this morning is because of an encounter with a resurrected God that I had in my early 20s. When I was full of rage and pain and anger and addiction, I've shared my story many times from this pulpit, and I will not belabor you this morning with it again. But a life of addiction and bondage and chains. And the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead raised my mortal body. A prisoner in the maximum security wing of the Tamaulipas State Penitentiary in central Mexico. A chief in a sub-Saharan village in northern Africa, in northern Ghana. And a father and son from Georgia. It seems like four radically different stories. But it's not. It's one story. And the story is this. The same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead can raise you from the tomb that you are in this morning. The same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead can break your chains. The same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead can break your addiction. The same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead can raise you into newness of life. Jesus said, I have come that you, that you might have life and have it more abundantly. 
That is what Easter is about. The relationship has been restored. The veil has been torn. And the resurrected life that raised Jesus and raised those people in Jerusalem continues to raise people from the dead to this day. That is the power and the story of Easter. We add nothing to it. We don't put our own interpretation on it or our own spin on it. The veil is torn. The body was sacrificed. The blood was shed. The relationship was restored. And three days later, the body is raised. The power, the resurrection life that filled Christ Jesus also fills us. And we can inherit that same life now and also glory to God for eternity. The resurrection power of Jesus doesn't do anything halfway. It is life for you now and it is life for forever. Life for now and life yet to come. That is the story of Easter. That is the power of our resurrected Lord. Now here's what I'm going to do. In just a moment, I'm going to pray to end this. And I'm going to ask every person watching that they would pray with me. And I want to give you this opportunity. I cannot have you raise your hand. I cannot see you. I cannot have you come to the front. There's no one here. What I want you to do is if you want that life-giving power, I want you to pray inside of your spirit. Talking about adding things to the Bible. You know there's no sinner's prayer in the Bible. There's no specific way we're supposed to pray for salvation. The clearest we have is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. So as I pray over all of you, I want you to pray. Pray that to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Thank him for his power. Receive his life and give him whatever chain or addiction or bondage you've been holding on to. Don't compartmentalize anymore. Give him your whole life. Make him Lord and Master. He is Savior. Make him Lord and Master. Do that as I pray over all of you. Bow your head and close your eyes if you will. Lord, I thank you for every person watching this live and for every person that will watch it in the future. And I, I pray right now as we end this message for any of you any of you that are struggling with some addiction, some bondage, some chain, in the name of Jesus, give it to him right now. Receive and inherit that resurrection life. The same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead is available to fill your mortal body. Receive it. Some others with you say, I don't know that I am a believer. I don't know that I've ever begun a relationship with, with Jesus. Do that right now. There's no special specific prayer just pray make him lord and master give him your life tell him you'll obey him you'll do anything he calls you to and and tell him that you want to inherit his life god wants you to have life in this moment and life yet to come receive it this morning take it this morning it's yours the relationship has been restored through his body and blood Body broken, blood shed, the relationship is restored. The life, the power, the spirit that raised him back to life, the resurrection power that was inside Jesus, not only raised those people in Jerusalem to life, but it still raises all of us to life. Receive the life. Receive the relationship. That is what Easter is about. Make him your Lord and Master. He is Savior. Make him Lord and Master. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I pray that this is a wonderful, wonderful, awesome, magnificent Easter for you and your family. I'm sorry that we are physically separated. But please know that we are together as believers we are together in spirit. We worship together. I pray that you have a wonderful Easter wherever you are. 
Remember, the relationship has been restored. The resurrection life is available to you. Receive it. Have a wonderful week. God bless you. If you need anything, please contact the church office. Happy Easter. He is risen indeed. God bless you, everybody.